Guys, what's going on? This is Matt with Patriots Corner. Now we have a special guest on Patriots Corner today. Writer, Gold Star sibling, military wife, and Patriot, Renee Nickel. Renee, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Thanks and, for having me. Of course. Thank you for joining us on Patriots Corner. You have such a, an incredible story um, that we're going to get into. Uh, and it's it's so beautiful, and it shows so much patriotism and and at the same time it shows so much love for you know your family for your brother yeah yeah it's um it's been a long journey so to get to this point now if you want to kind of give a background of everything you know i mean is to to what had happened to your brother and what now caused you uh to go on and write such an incredible story and, and tell his story. Well, um, you know, anyone who knows my brother knows what an incredible person he was. Um, he wasn't one way to some people and another way to other people. He was just himself to everybody. And, um, just, just really down to earth, really humble. And I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even know that he flew F-18s. He was, he just wasn't a bragger. He just, um, he was just an overall, you know, great person. And, um, after he stopped flying, um, as a pilot, he joined the fourth Anglico unit in West Palm beach. Wow. And so he became a forward air controller. Um, so he was the detachment officer in charge and, um, he wanted to, uh, deploy the third time. Um, you know, to make sure his men got home safe. And so uh, they went over there. They were five weeks into the deployment. This was his third deployment. Um, and he saw one of his guys under heavy fire for um, a long period of time. And so, you know, when they came in back into base, you know, he was viewing, he had been viewing the live feed. And so he he was watching what was happening. Um, and so when they came back in, my brother was like, you know, uh, I'm going to take your shift. You know, you're, you're under, you've, you've been under heavy fire. You know, I just, um, I'm going to go out there and take your place and you can view the feed. And, you know, it's out of character for, um, for an officer to go out and put himself in that kind of position, but it wasn't out of character for my brother to do something like that. Um, he just really, really cared about his Marines. And when he, um, him and Sergeant Winters went out. Uh, they were about 200 feet from the compound, and you know, bullets just started raining down. And they crouched down into a ditch, and they didn't know where the fire was coming from. Um, you know, and in an incredible act of bravery, my brother stood up to, you know, essentially take fire on himself to kind of get identification of where the enemy was was firing from. And he wasn't able to get back down in time and he was, he was shot and killed instantly. So, but, um, because of that, his, you know, every, they all survived, they all came home, every single one of them. So, um, after that, it's, you know, we, we went through a very difficult journey, my family and, and myself. And, um, you know, I just, I always knew I wanted to write a book. I, I didn't know what it would be about. Um, after my brother died, of course, I, I wanted to write something about him and my relationship with him, but it was, you know, it was a good six years before I was even ready to, you know, finally put that pen to paper and tell our story. So, so did even as a, uh, when you were younger, you always had the want to write a book? Um, not really when I was younger. Um, uh, probably it wasn't until maybe my late twenties, okay. um, that I, I thought I lived an interesting enough life, you know, with, with the trials and tribulations that I had been through, I felt like I had some wisdom to offer other military spouses and, and parenting and that sort of thing. But it wasn't really until Sam died that I knew I had a story that would really, really impact people. Absolutely. I mean, just, uh, from hearing you speak just now, I mean, it's definitely impacted me. That is, uh, your brother is a hero, and that yeah. is an incredible thing. And, and you know, something I want to really touch on is listening to you tell that story of what had happened. You know, that is something that people they need to 
they need to hear they need to read they need to they need to understand that that there are uh you know men and women in this world who are you know basically in what would be almost as a, a david and goliath you know what i mean and yeah. and somebody is willing to go out there and to risk everything uh right. for the sake of his team you know yeah. and in the same uh fashion it's just so significant when it comes to displaying patriotism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I don't think, I, I really feel like, um, there's a lot of civilians who really don't understand the selflessness that our men and women, um, display, you know, they, they give up everything. They give up, you know, family vacations and birthdays and anniversaries and Christmases and the birth of their children, you know, they do these things because they love their country. They love what it stands for. You know, they love their family. They want to protect what they have and they, they love their brothers and sisters who they're fighting beside. Um, and you know, it's just, I really wish Americans could really grasp what our men and women in the military do what they sacrifice. And, um, yeah, my, my brother, um, you know, he, he is my hero, you know, he just, and, and so many more are my hero too, you know, that they would be willing to just give up so much, you know, ultimately, and even their lives for me and for this country. Absolutely. And that's such an excellent point. I mean, this was one of the sole reasons, yes, it is to hear, uh, incredibly patriotic, uh, you know, military based stories, um, in how each individual went about, uh, carrying out that story and, and, you know, allowing that story to come about. Um, but it's also to pay tribute, you know, to right. gentlemen like your brother, I mean, and you and your family, I mean, just everything, uh, you know, that has happened and how you have all been able to, you know, carry on. And obviously, you know, how you had said, I mean, to come with that is, is, you know, times of pain and suffering. But at the same time, you know, what your brother did uh, is just, it's, it's almost, it's not, like you said, it's not heard of, you know, I mean, it, yeah. it, it'd be hard to have uh, somebody who would completely not understand, even come to the you know, point of, of being able to grasp somewhat of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, that, yeah. It, and that's why I think that they're, you know, I mean, men like your brother, they are, it's a different walk of life and it's, and it's something that's just so strong and powerful. It's like steel, you know, something that cannot be broken. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, and, and my parents just did a really great job when we were kids at instilling that foundation in us. Um, you know, my, my grand, both my grandparents served in World War II. Um, I have an uncle who served in Vietnam. I have uncles, you know, who served in the Air Force. My dad, my stepdad were both in the Army. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, we come from, you know, a long line of, of you know, um, military, military service. Family, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my brother always knew, you know, he said from the time he was five years old that he was going to be a fighter pilot. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so he was just a very determined individual, you know, and, and I think I think that's just a really special um, quality in people, you know, when they they know from such a young age um, that they want to do something and they just work and they just persevere and they don't expect handouts. They don't expect anybody to give anything to them. They just do everything they can to make a dream happen. And, you know, I just, I learned so many of those qualities from my brother and that really, really helped me, you know, after he died, you know, to have that same spirit. Absolutely. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I, I can say it wasn't easy. Sure. Yeah, of course. I could only imagine. And, and so your brother, he always wanted to be uh, a Marine fighter pilot. Well, he thought he was going to go into the air force okay. and, um, it wasn't until he was in college that, you know, he, he was given the opportunity for a Marine ROTC scholarship. Um, so that's really when the talk of becoming a Marine 
started happening was when he was already in college. Um, but he, I don't think he would have really cared what branch he served in. He just wanted to fly. So uh, whatever he had to do to make that possible, um, you know, it just so happened that it ended up being the Marine Corps and he ended up being a fantastic Marine. And oh, I, I, I think I any imagine. of his guys yeah. can attest to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, was he just, you know, amped up? I mean, when he when, when he got to that point, from what you remember, um, you know, and he was ready to sign the documents and he was ready to go. How excited was he? Oh, my gosh. You know, he he just embraced that role immediately. Um, he uh, it just brings a smile to my face when I think about him because I know how he was with us and, and as a family, and he would tell me stories about him being in, um, you know, being a, a drill instructor during his college years, and and um, and I would just laugh because I couldn't picture him like yelling at other Marines, <laughs> you know, and and um, but yeah, he did. He just took on that leadership role, you know, in, immediately, and uh, when he was testing to see you know, if he was going to get jets or helicopters, you know, he, I have this, you know, I actually wrote about it in the book, but you know, he called my mom and he was like, you know, I just, I don't know if I'm going to get jets and I'm really okay with whatever I get. You know, I just, I just want to fly. And my mom's thinking, of course, yeah, right. You know, (laughs) everybody knows you want jets, but you know, he was just kind of preparing for himself, but he ended up scoring at the top and he got his first pick of uh, the F-18, and so he called her up just screaming and hooting and hollering. He was like, I got jets, I got jets. So that was a really, really proud moment, and, you know, I'm glad to say that I was there for his winging, and, um, you know, I just, I'm just glad I got to be a part of that journey with him. Of so course. He, he, and yeah. I get this image with your brother, you know, I mean, I mean, I wish I would, would have had the opportunity to meet him, because it just sounds, you know, he sounds so amazing, and uh, I just get, you know, even you saying, you know, I really don't care what I get. You know, I just want to fly, and I could yeah. I could see that. You know, I mean, that's just such a uh, a beautiful thing. I mean, it really defines just a humble individual. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, well, it just and just the fact he was like, if I don't get jets, I'm I'm going to quit. I'm not going to do this anymore. Sure. You know, he just he just wanted to fly. He wanted to serve his country, and um, you know, he did. He did. And that's another cool thing as well, because I feel like he he was the type of person where going into it, you know, he had just so much respect for the men and women who had been there before. So uh, during placement, I mean, it it just sounds like he completely knew everything as far as being prepared for, you know, the testing and the training and, you know, stuff that he was going to have to then perform to get placed to where he was going to be. Oh, yeah. He, you know... He didn't live under a rock in that regard. He was he was totally aware of uh, what what he had um, what he had to to overcome, you know, to do what he wanted to do. And and I'm not saying you know he never got discouraged. You know he he wasn't you know just on top of the world all the time. You know he he really had to push through you know a lot of hard times and um, and uh, but he did. He just continued to. And, and, you know, so he ended up being one of the very few who, who fight, fly fighter, fighter jets. So it's, um, I was always really proud of him. As a matter of fact, when I was a senior in high school and he was an ROTC, you know, it's just, it was my senior prom and, and I just, you know, I was going with a group of friends and, and I was like, you know, my brother's going to be down visiting my mom uh, from college. And I just wanted to take him. And I told him, make sure you wear your uniform. <laughs> and, you know, and I just, I'm sure all uh, your friends were going nuts. They probably want I'm sure they were excited, too. Yeah, they were. You know, so we had this this Marine with us, you know, and and um, he pretty much babysat me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was just always so proud of him. You know, I just, I wanted to talk about him. I wanted to tell people about him. So it's not, um, you know, I'm not surprised at all that I wanted to write a book about him. <laughs> sure, <laughs> he, sure. He just, he meant a lot to me. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Um, I wanted to ask you too, how much schooling goes in after he got placed with flying F-18s? I mean, that's, 
there's a lot of schooling with that, a lot of in the uh, in the room kind of classroom material too, isn't there? Yeah, I want to say I want to say there's you know there's about six weeks I think of ground training before you know they even enter a simulator. Um, there's just you know looking back on the time frame, you know there was there was a lot of classroom. Um, a lot of horsing around too, you know, with his buddies down in Pensacola, (laughs) but yeah, he, um, he was, uh, he was in a classroom a lot, uh, before he even, before he was even in any flight simulator. So, and that's something I think a lot of civilians also forget about, you know, guys in the military. I mean, as far as how much, I mean, it's a lot of brain. You know, I mean, what your brother was doing, oh, yeah. with, that's the intelligence level is is so high. I mean, the bar is so high and, and he scored an extremely good score, you had said, right? Correct. Yeah. And I mean, my brother was was just a very intelligent person. Sure. Um, you know, thinking back to all his his elementary school antics that my parents were just so frustrated with him. Uh, you know, he was just getting trouble, getting in trouble in school a lot. And, you know, finally a teacher said, you know, let's, we need to test Sam. You know, I think there's something else going on. And, and he tested academically gifted and he was pulled from the school he was in and he was placed in a gifted program. And from there he just soared. Um, so there's some, um, encouragement to parents <laughs> who may be struggling with, absolutely. You know, with a child who doesn't necessarily really fit in very well in school, they might be dealing with something, you know, like academically gifted. But, um, yeah, so he was, he's always been very bright, um, very meticulous. He was always into building model cars and model trains. We had a huge train display in our basement at home and, and when we lived in Pennsylvania. Um, and, I mean, I mean, he would just take these grains of sand and color them green for the grass. I mean, I mean, this, this train display was just incredible and he was doing it at, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. And, um, and so he just, he was just, um, just really, uh, detail oriented and, um, driven, very motivated and very driven. And that's so wild, too, because, you know, I mean, even how you're saying at a young age, I mean, he was doing model cars and he was hands on stuff that, you know, grown men can't even do, you know, at a certain oh, yeah. point. Um, I actually grew up with a friend of mine. I can't mention his name. He's now a, a Navy SEAL. You know, his father used to say the same thing. I mean, he, he I don't I don't know if he actually had ever went on to college. I can't speak on that. But I mean, I remember my dad had come across his dad and congratulated him on his son's accomplishment. And, you know, he just said that he was kind of lost at a younger age, but he could pick a a lock. I mean, you know, hands on stuff was not an issue, you know, and then that intelligence, it came out, it blossomed, you know what I mean? And then bang, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. So yeah, it's, um, oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Just uh, go ahead. No, I was just saying, you know, those, um, I, I, you know, sometimes, I, well, I just believe, you know, it's just one of those God given qualities that is instilled, you know, it's, um, you know, for these pilots, you know, and, and that's the thing too, is, is the civi- I don't, I don't think the civilian world really understands what goes in to training these men and, and women, you know, I mean, even like you said, the Navy SEALs, I mean, they go under such tremendous training, the, the normal, the normal common Joe would, it would blow their mind if they knew, you know, the kind of intense training that these guys go through. Oh, well it's, and that being said, it's why they got the, uh, the saying, you know, the few, the proud. So exactly. It goes hand in hand with that. Um, so I wanted to get into uh, more of an in-depth question. When you had heard the news about your brother, what kind of emotions were you then experiencing and feeling at the time? Well, when I when my mom called me that morning, um, I heard her crying on the phone, and I knew something had happened to my brother, but because I wasn't worried about what he did and I wasn't 
worried before he left for Afghanistan, even when I hugged him goodbye, you know, I wasn't worried about him because to me he was invincible. He was my big brother. Sure. Um, and so when my mom called me and she was crying and I couldn't make out what she was saying, there was that split instant that I was thinking my brother was injured. He's coming home. Everything's going to be okay. At least he's alive. Mm -hmm. the, those were the thoughts that entered my brain. And then when she said your brother was killed in Afghanistan and I just, I, I mean, I went to a grief seminar one time and the, ins the instructor had us think of a metaphor for that moment when we found out. And that morning I felt like I was on this mountaintop and it was a great day and the kids were getting ready for school and I was, you know, getting ready to go Christmas shopping because, you know, we were 11 days away from Christmas. And when she called and told me that it was like I had been standing on this mountaintop and the earth just crumbled beneath me and I just fell in this the dark hole, you know, and it took just one stone at a time to crawl out of that hole. And it took a long, long time. Um, but it, it was earth shattering to me and my whole family. It was just absolutely devastating. And, um, and I struggled with depression shortly after I didn't even realize I was depressed, but, um, you know, four months after, after he died, you know, I, I was struggling with suicidal thoughts. Um, you know, he, he was, he may, had made such an impact in my life and, and, and I just, I didn't know how I was going to go on without him, you know, and it's, it's, I tell people this, it's not that I wanted to die. It's just that I didn't want to live with the pain anymore. Sure. And, you know, and that depression just hit so strong, you know, it just comes out of nowhere. You know, you're not thinking, Oh, I'm, I'm depressed. You know, it really, um, it really took my husband um, and, you know, those closest to me around me to realize, you know, Renee, we've, we've got to do something about this. So. So, I mean, as far as how, I mean, it just sounds as if it was a lot of just confusing emotions just overall. I mean, was it tough at the time to just kind of understand fully that your brother was killed. Yeah, there was, you know, the first year is always the hardest or I'm sorry, the second year is actually the hardest, but the first year you're in a state of shock. So you start having these thoughts like maybe, it, maybe he didn't die. Maybe it wasn't him. Um, you know, we didn't get to see his body, you know, he was cremated. And, and so there was just this, I mean, even through like the second year, I was thinking, what if it wasn't him? What if he's, you know, been placed on this secret mission and your, and your mind just starts telling you all of these things to protect itself. Sure. And, um, and so, yeah, there is, you know, nobody prepares you for this kind of thing. You know, I, I mean, you just don't think it's going to happen to you, mm -hmm. but, um, and, and so when it does happen, what I realized, um, was, that there's just, it's not talked about enough. Um, you know, the, the families that are left behind, it's just kind of, the story kind of ends with, with the sacrifice, with the military member dying. And then the families are just kind of left to pick up the pieces. And, and I didn't know how to do that. Yeah. And I feel, you know, I mean, you being part of this now, I mean, it's like a, a new wave of stories coming out, which then expresses how you did deal with it. You know, I mean, how, how you went about your recovery, um, similar to something, you know, I mean, like with Taya Kyle, I had her on the show and she shared, you know, stuff that was very similar to what you had said. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, something that I think most definitely needs to be talked about more, which is so fantastic in, you know, you taking the stand and, and being, uh, the hero you are in providing other oh, people with this you. advice. No, absolutely. I mean it, you know, significantly. I mean, it's, it's a tough thing I'm sure to, to deal with. And, you know, you are the Northern light at the same time as your brother was, you know, I mean, people will be able to now follow this and understand and, and apply it most definitely. Uh, well, I certainly appreciate your kind words. Um, I, I 
don't see myself that way. I just, I see myself as just, you know, a sister who wants to tell the world about her, you know, incredible brother and his sacrifice. And I just want his legacy to just continue on. And I want people to know that there are, you know, hurting families out there and there are siblings who feel lost in the grief because, you know, they take on this role of, of helping the parents and the spouse and the kids and, and they just push their grief aside, you know, and, and they be, just become forgotten in that. And, um, and so I'm just, I'm just incredibly grateful that I've been given an opportunity to, you know, be their voice, so to speak. And, you know, let people know that, you know, there are families that, you know, go on to grief forever. Grief never goes away. It's always there. It's, it's your new companion and it's going to be with you forever. Um, but in that there's also joy and there's also hope and there's, there's moments of happiness and, and you can create a new life for yourself and you can do things to honor your sibling or your son or your daughter or your spouse, you know? So, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just thankful that I've been able to, to do that in some small way. Now I wanted to even get into the, what does it mean to be a gold star sibling? Well, it comes with tremendous pride and honor. Um, but it's like being a part of a club that you don't want to be in. And, um, you know, for siblings, even though we spend more time with in our lifespan, um, together than, than even with our parents or spouse, you know, we're rarely acknowledged as an integral part of the family, um, after a military death. Um, when I, when my brother was killed and, um, you know, people were traveling to Dover, you know, I had to find my own way. And, you know, if it, if it hadn't been for a pastor who provided our family with, financial means to drive from Florida all the way to Dover, you know, I most likely wouldn't have been able to go, you know, my parents were in a state of shock, you know, Mm -hmm. they weren't in any position to make any decisions. Um, and so, you know, siblings just kind of are, um, kind of in the, in the, in the background and, um, you know, as a gold star sibling, you know, we have to learn to navigate not only the loss, but also doing it alone in most cases. So, you know, we do have tremendous pride for, for our sibling and also tremendous pain that is just rarely acknowledged. Well, I noticed that you did mention, um, that you had learned a lot about what forgiveness is and even more so what forgiveness is not. And I felt like there was so much to that uh, quote. Um, what exactly were you meaning when you when you said that? I feel like it could tie into kind of what we're talking about now with the gold star sibling. Yeah, you know, in more, from, in more cases than not, the, from what I've seen, um, is that families really go through a lot of change um, after a military death, um, families fall apart, people stop speaking to one another, um, you know, and so family dynamics change drastically. And sometimes there's just no preventing that. And I think people use the term forgiveness very loosely. And we say we forgive a person, but then we go out of our way to maybe be vindictive or, or vengeful or, um, you know, just speak, uh, negatively. And after Sam had died, our family fell apart, like many Gold Star families. And what I had to learn for myself is that true forgiveness, if I want to display, you know, I mean, I'm a Christian. So if I want to display what it, what it is to be a Christian, if I want to be an example, then I have to do the hard work of working on me. And I have to come to terms with that forgiveness really means that you're letting the other person off the hook. You're taking expectations off of them. You're wishing them the best and hoping that they have peace and blessing in their life and and being okay with that. And in doing that, we free ourselves from that bondage of bitterness that can form in our hearts. Um, you know, that bitterness can, can grow so easily when you have experienced that kind of trauma. 
And I just had to get to that place of just letting things be. Um, and so I learned a lot about forgiveness. You know, I, I read a lot of books about it because I was really, really struggling with it for a long time. Um, you know, even before my brother died, I, I always struggled with forgiveness. And, um, and I just, you know, I didn't want to be an angry person. I didn't want to grow. I didn't want to display that to my children. I didn't want them to see that that was okay. Um, and I, I just, I wanted to be able to move forward in my life in a positive way. Now, did that at all prevent you at times from starting your book? It did. Um, cause I had started the book probably, I, it was around 2013 and I were, I was several thousand words into the book. Um, and I just realized I had to stop. Um, I wasn't ready. My book would have been completely different than what it is today. And I just had to put it down. And so I put it down for another four years. Wow. And, um, yeah. And during that time I went, I did, you know, a lot of therapy. I did, um, actually the, the thing that made the biggest impact in my life was actually working with horses. Um, we had the whole family in there doing horse therapy and learning to communicate better. And, um, and then I finally, you know, I got to this point, actually a friend had prompted me, you know, and she was like, Renee, when are you going to write that book? And, and I think she must have seen something in me that prompted her to say that because I was in, she saw me, you know, I mean, she saw me from day one. So to, to where I was, you know, six, seven years later and she prompted me and I, and it made me think, and I was like, yeah, you know, let's, let, let me look at this again. And that's when, you know, things just really, really started moving quickly. Now, did you ever, in the time frame of you starting the book and then putting it down for, how you said, four years, was there ever uh, an emotion of fear um, or anger that caused you kind of not to go back to it? Um, well, I, I can tell you fr from... Or this, like an anxiety feeling, you know what I mean? To broaden it a little bit more. I mean, as far as this, the uh, the emotions, I'm sure, that came with writing the book. I mean, obviously, I'm sure a very difficult thing to do. But then in the same time, or at the same time, excuse me, a beautiful thing to do. I mean, I'm sure it brought back many memories. Oh, yeah. Well, when you're writing a book, you're, you're not just looking at things from one angle. Um, you know, you're revisiting so many past memories, past hurts. Um, you're reevaluating your childhood and how you were brought up. You know, you're um, you're you're thinking about um, you know the kind of person you were. You know, when you know, like when my brother died and and who I was now. And, um, you know, I had to evaluate my relationship with my children, you know, and I mean, there was a time where I was an emotionally absent mother from them for two years. I have very few memories. My son was one when my brother died. And so I had to go back and look through pictures. And so there's just this self evaluation that happens. So yeah, there is a little bit of anxiety and fear facing all of that. I mean, that's, that's really hard for any of us to do. Of course. And you know, when I found my publisher, um, you know, she coached me through the writing process. She was really my encouragement and my accountability. And, and when she told me, she was like, Renee, we're going to have this book written in three months. I thought she was crazy. I was like, there's no way I can write a book in three months. And she, you know, and we would argue and she would say, yes, you, yes, you can do this. <laughs> and, you know, and she explained it to me like this, let's just rip the bandaid off. Instead of dragging this out for nine or 12 months, let's just rip that Band-Aid off and allow this book to be a, a, a more um, another step in your healing. And that's what it was. And um, so while I revisited, you know, all of these painful memories, you know, I was really blessed with an opportunity to meet all of these really fantastic people from my brother's past. Sure. I met so many Marines that I hadn't known. Um, I got to know college friends better. 
um, you know, just, I just interviewed all of these people I, I never knew. And these, I knew, learned these stories that I had never known. And that just brought so much more healing to my own life, you know? So it was, it just kind of, it, it was parallel to the pain, but it was very helpful. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you, Renee. It sounds as if they can make a movie on this. I'm being t completely serious. I mean, just just everything after the fact as to all the, the research and homework that you did to put this together is incredible. It truly is. Well, I can say I look back and I can't believe I did that. Um, I have people who have you know, ask me if I'm going to write another book and I would like to write another book. I just don't know what it would be on right now because right now I'm so focused on telling my brother's story, um, that, you know, that's, that's my main priority right now. And I do, um, I have had, you know, this vision of seeing his, him, the story on, on the big screen. Um, I have for, you know, a few years now. Um, it's actually, just, um, I think about it all the time. I mean, at least once a day I think about it. And so that is the goal. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm continuing to pound the pavement and work as hard as I can and, and get this book out there. And, you know, I just, I feel like, you know, America needs hope and they need to see, um, somebody like my brother and, and, um, they need to see that, you know, you can persevere and you know, you got, you just, you got to have that grit and you got to have that determination and we all go through hard times. You know, there's none of us who are, who are free from, you know, a perfect life or a good life. Sure. But you know, it's just, I, I get so much hope when I hear other, other gold star um, sibling stories or other gold star family stories. And I know a lot of incredible people who are doing so many things, um, you know, to help others because, you know, their son or daughter or brother or sister died in war. So, um, yeah, that would be a fantastic thing to bring more awareness to this, to this story. Absolutely. And did you, I want to ask you this, did you ever notice at any time when you were writing uh, your book, was there at any point where you felt like your brother was almost there with you, almost, where it's like, you know what I mean? Kind of like how people will sometimes from time to time get, get this, you know, the overwhelming feeling of like an adrenaline almost. I mean, with what you're running with, was there ever a point in time where you felt something just different that you hadn't felt before that caused you to put the words down on paper? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, not in like a creepy sense, but it's not creepy you know, at all. I, Trust me. I think yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. I there's there was a lot of moments where I just knew that um, certain things couldn't have happened you know, unless, you know, there was a door that's open. Of course, I rely um, primarily on my faith in God. And, you know, it's a huge part of my life. It's really what saved my life. And, you know, and I just believe that, you know, we serve a very loving God who gives us those moments. And, um, you know, tr I'm trying not to get too emotional here, but, you know, there were that moments that I knew that Sam was there with me, you know, when I'm, you know, sitting down with these Marines from his past and, you know, I'm hearing all of these stories, you know, and I mean, just doors that open miraculously for me to be able to do that. You know, I just, I could see him cheering me on. And, oh, um, that's such a cool thing. Yeah. That is so awesome. Seriously, like that is such a cool thing. I mean, and, and everything you're doing right now is so beautiful i mean there's no other word other than than it being beautiful i mean at least in my opinion and and it's something that like you said you know most definitely needs to be talked about and i think it's so cool that you're doing it you're doing Thank it you. i mean it's not something where you know a lot of people will say you know oh i i will go and i will do that you know how many times i've heard that you know what i mean that's this one thing that my parents they they raised me on is that they said you know matt if you say you're going to do it we'll do it yeah yeah, and I try to teach my kids that too. So if, if you're going to try this sport and I'm going to put money into it, you better stick with it. 
but does it ever know, come I, does it ever come with a lot of well mom and then and then <laughs> which then causes a lot of anger that's that's at yeah. least how my parents would react yeah matt <laughs> we're gonna spend this money on you to go to this training if you're gonna say you're gonna do it we'll do it and then there's it sometimes it always seemed like maybe there was another argument that led afterwards yeah typically <laughs> <laughs> but you know i just i want to continue to carry the torch for him you know it's it's my responsibility as uh, as a sister, and it's my honor to do so. And um, you know, he he lived an incredible life and made such an impact on so many people um, that I'm just I'm privileged with this opportunity to continue his story and um, and, and help others do the same. You know, I want other other family members to feel just as free to tell the stories that they have. And I think it's another thing that um, I want to say as well, how when I said as far as people following your advice and how you had said, I don't look at myself like that. You know, I mean, you're doing it for the want to carry your brother's legacy and your brother's story and carry that torch. And I think that that's something that displays somebody who has something in them that somebody else might not. I mean, I remember when I was a young kid, I was at a camp in Vermont, and I remember there was an old man who said to me, or said to all of us, how you earn, uh, you know, say it was um, like a patch, I think it might actually have been a Boy Scout camp, you know, and he had said, how you earn that patch is doing something when nobody else is watching. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah, and it's something that's so true, and I think that if people just understood you know, that entirely, you could do anything. Oh, absolutely. I I just, I've gotten to a place in my life where I just feel like the sky's the limit. Anything is possible. There you, you know, go. I mean, a couple of years ago, I was, and I, I don't mean this, you know, I'm not saying I'm just a stay-at-home mom, mom, but, you know, I was, you know, a stay-at-home mom, a military wife. I had been for 16 years. I was happy in that role. Um, It gave me great fulfillment. And when I look back at the past two years at what has happened, I mean, now I'm re-releasing a book with, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, who wrote writing the foreword, you know, so um, it's just it's just mind blowing what has happened if if you have the determination and the belief that anything is possible. That is so wonderful. And by the way, my mother listens to each podcast. I would never ever underplay that being a stay-at-home mom is easy. <laughs> I would never, I would never downplay that. If I, if I wanted, yeah, if I want to go back home to New Jersey and visit, I would never yeah. downplay that ever. <laughs> yeah, shout out to all the moms who stay at home and do the hard work of the twenty-four hour, seven day a week job. I mean, there- it's. Not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Very true. Now I want to ask you: uh, When is the official release date? You have it. You have a re- official release date. I do. So um, the first edition came out July fourth of of two thousand and eighteen, um, and then uh, in January I decided to republish and. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West uh, was very gracious enough to write the forward for me. He wrote a beautiful forward. So I really hope that those who already have the book um, might even get the Kindle edition and, and um, so they can read the forward because he just did a beautiful job. And uh, so the, the second edition will be released on my brother's birthday, June 14th, with, which is also Flag Day. So I just found it really fitting to uh, release the second edition um, on that day. And he really loved Alan West. So, um, it's just, it, it's extra special. It says little things like that, that, um, you know, you know, like you said, you mentioned about him being with me, you know, it says little things like that, that make me feel like he's with me. Absolutely. And then is there any other, anything else that you would like to share? I mean, for all the listeners, uh, who, who, you know, could in fact be struggling with, uh, the situation that, you, you know, you have and you know struggle with from time to time and then just in general you know I mean just is there anything um well I I just I first and foremost I'm just incredibly grateful to the men and women who serve this country um you know that I'm just very grateful that there's patriotic families who love this country and who are willing to take on the whole hard role of being a military mom or dad 
or spouse or brother or sister or, or, or child, um, you know, and they do it with grace and with pride and with honor. And so I just, just really want to express my gratitude to all of them. And I'm grateful to those relationships that help, helped me during the most difficult times of my life um, and has allowed me to be to be there for others. And, um, you know, to those who are grieving, you know, I said earlier, the first year is a state of shock. The second year is worse than the first. I wish people would have told me that because you're you're stepping into the reality of of how your your life is going to be. Um you know, don't place any expectations on yourself or others within the family. You know, that's really where resentment builds. Just, you know, you just have to focus on yourself. Um, a lot of people will give you the do's and don'ts of grieving and every situation is unique. But, um, you know, I really want to emphasize that just because my brother died in combat and just because I'm labeled by the Department of Defense as a gold star sibling, my loss is no greater or no less than any other loss, um, whether it be suicide, accident, or sickness, you know, we all have to support one another right where we are and grief never goes away and it will always be your companion. You know, like I said earlier, um, but you'll learn a new way, you know, you'll, you'll one day eventually, (sighs) sorry, that's okay. You'll eventually look back and you'll realize how far you've come. And, you know, those are the moments where, you know, those that go ahead of us, you know, I know Sam's proud. So. Absolutely. Ab- absolutely. That's such a beautiful saying. And, and it's very, very true. You're such a patriotic. Uh, you are a hero. You are. I, I, I <laughs> loved. I'm telling you, I loved having you on the show. Your brother, you. oh my gosh, you know, it, it, an incredible hero. Uh, uh, I'd want to mention his name. It's Samuel Griffith, correct? Yes. Oh, that's so wonderful. And it's, it's just such an incredible, incredible story. Um, and it's just so amazing. I, I can't Thank begin you. to tell you. The book, for everyone listening, the book to buy, Always My Hero, The Road to Hope and Healing Following My Brother's Death in Afghanistan, and that is, your story is just, I have no other words other than it being amazing. And I think well, everything, you. everything that you're doing is so amazing. And, you know, your brother, like you had said, watching, you know, looking down on you and, and is just, yeah, cheering you on. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. And I just, I'm so incredibly grateful for this opportunity uh, to share a little bit more of my story and a little bit more of my brother with with all your listeners. So, you know, thank you so much for taking taking the time out to to hear me. Well, the feeling is mutual. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. You know, I mean, this story is about, uh, you know, heroes who are coming on the show to share their story. And you and your brother both are heroes, in my opinion, and, and in my eyes. So I thank you, Renee, for being on Patriot's Corner. Thank you so much.